This short video introduces 2D elements and focuses on initially the three-noted triangular linear element. So let's review what we need to do to define a new element. We need to make some decisions and we also need to define some vectors and matrices. So first off, you want to decide what are what is the displacement field that you're interested in. Uh, what does that vector look like? Also the strain and stress fields are important. Then you can define your element geometry and the degrees of freedom that are going to be relating back to that displacement field vector. That will give us a degree of freedom vector. Then we need to establish a shape function matrix that defines how the displacement field varies within the element and how that variation relates back to the degrees of freedom. We also look at the relationship between the strain vector and the uh, displacement field vector u. That gives us this partial derivative matrix operator. Next, we need to look at the relationship between stress and strain. That's going to give us our D matrix, which has our material properties in it. We also need to define a um, matrix that's the product of the partial derivative matrix operator and the shape function matrix. So this is just a matrix multiplication. That will give us B. And once we have B and D, we can go and find our stiffness matrix K for the new element. Finally, we want the element force vector. If we have a distributed force acting on the element, we need to define how we get an ele um, elemental force vector, which then gets added to the nodal forces to give us a global force vector. And one of the last things that we need to discuss is transformation. How are we going to take an element from its local coordinate system and apply it to whatever shape it becomes in the global system? We will defer transformation for a few videos, but the rest of these we'll focus on today. So let's get started making some decisions and defining a 2D right triangle element. This is a specialized element. It is a three-noted triangle, but it's going to have a 90-degree corner in it. And the reason that I choose this, I'll explain at the end of this slide. So uh, start out, we have to define what our displacement field is. This is in two dimensions, and I'm interested in translation of the nodes of my right triangle element in both the horizontal and the vertical direction, or the x and the y direction. I am also interested in the strains in the element. So in this case, I'm interested in the strain in the x direction, the normal strain x direction, the normal strain in the y direction, and then also the shear strain um, that links those two directions. I don't have any of the z component strains because this is a 2D element I'm developing. Similarly, I've got the stress vector that has the same components um, as the strain vector did. So this is my element geometry. It's going to be a right triangle. It's going to have a base of B and a height of H. Those are variables, so it can be any shape right triangle, but it needs to have that 90 degree corner for the one that I'm developing. I'm going to add my local coordinate axes, so an X prime and a Y prime axis in the locations you'd expect. And then I'm going to define my node numbers. So one is going to be right at the origin of my coordinate system, two is at the end of the horizontal leg, and three is at the end of the vertical leg. Now, this gives me my degree of freedom vector. I have six terms in it because I have three nodes and each one has two degrees of freedom. See how this is all related back. I choose the geometry and the nodes, but then I also defined my u vector, which gives me the directions that I'm interested in. Now, why did I choose to do a right triangle element? Well, most texts certainly look at a more complicated element. They don't restrict it to a right triangle, so you can have any angles, any sizes, which is a very useful element. Um, but the problem is you get so caught up in the math of trying to define any position for all your three points that you lose the actual development process. So I'm focusing on this simpler element, which is not as general. You won't even see it used in most FE codes. However, it gives me the power to uh, focus in on the process all the way through. So that's why I'm going through that in this video. So continuing our development of this linear right triangle element, we want to define the shape functions. We have three degrees of freedom in each direction. Now, because of 2D element, we need to talk about directions. So we have d1x, d2x, and d3x in the x direction. That means that for the polynomial for u, I can have three unknown coefficients in it. So I can write u of xy is equal to a0 plus a1x plus a2y. So by doing one x term and one y term, I've balanced this variation field. So my field is not um, 
is not biased towards the X direction or the Y direction in terms of the variation I'm allowing for strain or displacement inside the element. So now I want to determine what those coefficients are. So I start out with each one of my degrees of freedom. So D1X is going to be equal to whatever U is at zero, zero. And in this case, that's A naught. D2X is gonna be U evaluated at B comma zero, that's node two and that is an A0 plus A1B, and D3X is U evaluated at 0 comma H, so that's A0 plus A2H. I can take these three equations and solve them for my three A's. So A0 becomes D1X, A1 is 1 over B times D2X minus D1X, and A2 is 1 over H times D3X minus D1X. So now I don't need the A's because I'm just gonna substitute them in, but it's a, an important intermediate step to calculate them. So I plug them back into my U equation, and now I have the one shown here without any A's in it. So now I just have B and H, which are my dimensions, and then my X and Y, which are the, the variables that make this a function. And now I need to rearrange terms to gather everything multiplied by D1X, d2x and d3x and when I do that this is the expression I get now this defines my shape functions everything multiplied by d1x is n1 everything multiplied by t2x is n2 and everything multiplied by d3x is n3 now to put it into matrix form I want to think about the fact that I want to take these degrees of, I want to end up with this equation here u of x y equals um, the shape functions multiplied by the degrees of freedom. But I want to do this for both the x displacement, that's u, and also the y displacement, which is v. And the v is going to look the same as u is here. It's just going to have the d1y, d2y, and d3y. So when I put that all together, I get this relationship for my shape function matrix. This will give me a u of x, y that looks like this, and a v of x, y that looks very similar, just with a y subscript for each of my degrees of freedom terms. So now that we have the shape function matrix, we can move forward to get the b matrix. And of course, on the way, we need to define the partial derivative matrix operator. In fact, we're not gonna define it, we're just going to plop it out here because I've discussed this in the strength and material review um, video earlier in this series. So remember that we've got a relationship between strain and displacement, that's the partial derivative matrix operator, but what I really wanna do is define strain in terms of the degree of freedom vector D, that's where the B matrix comes into play. So remember my strain matrix, I decided it looked like this. We know from, again, the review of strength materials that the strain in the x direction is du dx, in the y direction is dv dy, those are the normal strains, and then the shear strain is du dy plus dv dx. So written in a matrix operator form, I now have my displacement field vector u, which has the terms uv, and it's pre-multiplied by this partial derivative matrix operator, which I call the Parcel symbol is equal to the, the matrix shown here. So now to get B, I take the partial derivative matrix operator and I have it act on the shape function matrix. Now when you do this for every new element, you need to make sure this multiplication works. And if you've set up your matrices properly, it will always work. So let's continue with that. I'm gonna multiply these matrices together. When I do that, I end up with the matrix in this form where I've used some initial notation to try to minimize the amount of space I'm taking up. So the comma X or comma Y actually represents a partial derivative with respect to that variable. So N1 comma X is DN1 DX. Now I know what my shape functions are, so I can actually calculate all of these partial derivatives. Here are the shape functions I previously developed. So the partial derivatives with respect to x are straightforward, and similarly with respect to y, there's a straightforward. I can take all of these partial derivatives, plug them into that B matrix, and I get this matrix. Now notice what happened here. I lost all the x's and y's, which we would expect because it was a linear function, and I'm taking the derivative of linear functions, I'm gonna get constant terms. But recall that strain is determined by multiplying the B matrix times the degree of freedom vector. That means because the B is constant and the degree of freedom vector never depends on position, 
I have no variation of strain in this element. The entire element will have exactly the same strain. This is what you get with a linear triangle. This is what would happen even if this was a, um, a any triangle, any triangle shape. It, the right triangle makes it look a little simpler, but it would always be constant. Okay, let's continue our development looking at the stress-strain relationship. This is just a quick review because we did this in uh, the Strength of Materials review video earlier in the series. So sigma x looks like this, sigma y, and tau xy. So that's my stress-strain relationship in a 2D plane stress state. Plane strain would be somewhat dif different. This is plane stress specifically. So now what I want to do is I want to write my stress vector is equal to some matrix D multiplied by my strain vector. And remember that my stress vector has three terms and my strain vector has three terms. So D is going to be a three by three matrix. And you can see that if I take those three equations at the top and put them into the matrix form, this is the matrix D I end up with. And this again was developed in more detail in an earlier video. Okay, so now we have all the pieces to put together our stiffness matrix. K is equal to the integral over the volume of B transpose DB. And here we go. Plug in the Bs that we found and the D. And in addition, I'm going to convert my volume integral into an integral over the thickness of the element um, inside of the integral over the cross section or the, the surface of the element rather, DA. So here, the integral from 0 to t of dz is just going to be t, the thickness of my element. So that will remain as a constant here, assuming that I have constant thickness throughout the element. And then the integral of dA, remember nothing else in here, if you look, depends on x or y. So I can just resolve that integral right away. So the integral um, over dA, I'm sorry, the integral over the cross-sectional area is bH over 2. And when we multiply those three matrices together, we get this unholy mess. Um, and this is uh, simpler than the general three node one. So we can see the B matrix here, or I'm sorry, we can see the K matrix here. You can see that because it's a right triangle, I've picked up a few zero terms in it. The general three node triangle will not have any three node terms in general. However, it will simplify to this one when you have a right triangle that you're analyzing. So that is the linear right triangle stiffness matrix. Okay, the last piece of the development that we're gonna go through for this linear right triangle is how do we handle distributed forces? So distributed forces for a uh, stress element consists of body forces or surface forces. And in all of my earlier videos when I was dealing with bars and beams, I said you can choose either one. You can't do that anymore. These are now distinct. Note that the NS here, this becomes important. We're evaluating it on the surface of interest. So what do I mean by body and a surface? Well, FB is the force that's acting everywhere inside the edges of the element. So it's throughout the body of the element. Whereas FS acts only at the element edges. I call it a surface because there's thickness. Remember, in a plane stress element, there is a cross section that would get sliced in the Z direction. So the surface is the thickness times whatever the length of that, um, that edge is. So FS is acting along element edges. Let's work through an example here. So here's the, the linear right triangle, and I've identified T as the thickness. I'm going to apply a body force, so throughout the inside of the element, and I'm gonna call that W. It's gonna have units of force divided by length cubed. So it always wants to be a force per volume in order to be a body term. So that means FB is zero in the X direction and minus W in the Y direction. That would be my FB for the integral above. I'm gonna add another force here, one that's acting on the edge or on the surface of the element. This is, I'm gonna call a traction. I'm gonna give it the term T. It's at 45 degrees ang degree angles downward, and it's going to have units of force per area, or newtons per meter squared as it's shown here. So because of the 45 degrees, I pick up a one over the square root of two for each direction, and the x is gonna be a positive for the surface force, or surface traction, and the y is gonna be in the negative direction. So that's my fs term. So putting these in and also showing the transpose of the shape function matrices. Let's first look at that first term for body force. That's the transpose of my um, 
shape function matrix, and I've got the zero minus w, pretty straightforward there. Add in the second term. Here, remember what I'm doing is I'm evaluating the shape functions on the surface of interest. So that means I'm evaluating them along the left edge of the element, the edge where x is equal to zero. So I have to evaluate each of them at zero comma y. And then I've also got my t over square root of two times the one negative one term. Now note here that when you evaluate shape function two, because it's a linear function, and because we know it has to be zero at nodes one and three, it has to be zero all along that edge. So it's gonna drop out, it's gonna become zero. Continuing this example, uh, when I multiply my shape function matrix times my body force term, I end up with this vector. And then when I do the same thing for my uh, surface traction term, I get this vector. Again, the N2 terms dropped out because N2 was equal to zero all along the left edge of the element. So remember, these are my shape functions. Let's go ahead and plug them in here for this element. Um, we are going to integrate along the edge of the element, the left edge. That's gonna be a straightforward integration from zero to H, but the, the integration over the surface of the element is gonna mean we're gonna to have to follow that um, the, the angled piece there. So I'm gonna evaluate that along the hypotenuse of the triangle, y is equal to h minus hx over b. So the first term becomes the shape function substituted in. I've converted my dA to a dy dx, where the, the dx is on the outside, so that's just zero to b. And then the dy is on the inside, so it goes from zero to the hypotenuse, which again is h minus hx over b. And the second term is just integrating from zero to h of the shape functions evaluated along that left edge. So just wrapping it up, you perform those integrals, and then you do a little bit of algebra, and you end up with this expression. So the left piece here corresponds to the uniformly distributed downward acting body force, and the right term is for the, um, at a 45 degree angle, downward to the right traction force. And I think if you did these, if you guessed, you would probably end up with these terms as well. Um, but remember, I chose very simple examples to show you the process. You could have now any variation of load as a body force or as a surface traction and still be able to capture it using this method.